this wonderful, rather noisy globe, who can resist spinning it? Once, many years ago, my finger settled here. Tristan de Kuna, Tristan de Kuna, a rock in the loneliest of all seas, a wisp of an island. The volcanic island of Tristan de Kuna, often called the loneliest island in the world, rises to a height of nearly 7,000 feet above sea level. First discovered in 1506 by Portuguese navigators, it's situated on the southern portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, together with four other volcanic islands. When us two old fogies leave, uh, <laughs> these young kids, are they going to have a Tristan that's just the same as it is, uh, as it is today? Well, that icon, I don't, I don't know. That's a question I can't answer, but I can't care less because I'll be done and gone. Sitting there reading Wikipedia and texting people. What's going on, Dave? What's up? Oh my gosh. I was just reading the craziest thing. Um, Tell me about it. What were you reading that was so worth reading that you made me sit here for hours? How long were you actually waiting? I don't know. Uh, Maybe maybe a minute. Okay. Oh, okay. So check this out. Although I did You're... try like 17 means of communication, apparently this <laughs> Wikipedia article is very good. It is very good. Okay, so I can't pronounce this, but it's the, I'll give it an all attempt. It's the Padman, Padmanabhaswami Temple in India. Mm. Okay? Mm. Mm-hmm. It's a temple in India that is very beautiful. It's like rises out of the city, looks like it's made of solid gold, right? How do I how do I say it? It's Pad it. Padmana Baswami. P A D B A Got it. You got it. Okay. So this temple is in India. And relatively recently, I think around the eighteen hundreds, it was discovered that there were eight underground vaults in this temple right holy smokes is it made of gold i i think the outside is actually plated with gold um holy shit inside of this temple in the basement there are eight gigantic vaults and they've opened they've opened seven of these vaults and in the seven that they've opened they found insane amounts of gold right Hmm. like hundreds of millions of dollars worth of gold and it's estimated that in this vault that has still not been opened and has not been opened for hundreds of years this one particular vault and the reason it hasn't been opened is because it has these snakes on the outside of it like cobras carved Mm. into the metal of the door and the people who run the temple see it as a bad omen to open it but the but the records that exist from what's inside that vault indicates that that one vault out of eight that has not been opened has a treasure inside that is valued at 720 billion (laughs) dollars no yes based on like the number of pounds of gold and stuff like that they have in in the other vaults that they have opened and inventoried because the indian government in the last 10 years made them open sev- some of the vaults that they didn't want to open and catalog what they had in there because they were going to tax them on it and somehow they got out of opening the last one that still has not been opened to this day mm-hmm. um but in the inventory that they did have it was just an astonishing amount of gold and this last vault that still remains unopened is the biggest one by far and they just think that there wow. are like just tons, actual tons of gold and diamonds and wow. rubies. And it's pretty fascinating, man. Um, who uh, do you know anything about who built it? Not personally. I mean, um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty nuts, man. Ooh, I'm looking up a picture. I'm looking up a picture of the vault. Yeah, vault that B- no one wants to open. Yowza. Pretty I don't blame creepy. them. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be some sort of uh, it. It looks like something straight out of Middle Earth, you know? Exactly. Well, it's interesting you say that because there is an idea in Hinduism called Patala. And this is a reason I know about this. I have a really good friend who turned me on to the concept of inner earth. 
And this is sort of a wackadoo theory that the that if you go up to the Arctic, there are actually inlets where you can go to like a subterranean world. Mm. And um, a lot of this stems from ancient myths, but also in the 40s, there was a guy named Admiral Byrd who flew who supposedly flew into this. He claims he did at least. And he actually met with this subterranean race of people. Hmm. Um, but in Hinduism, there's an idea called Patala, which is very similar to the inner earth idea. And a lot of people are saying that this vault B actually is a door that leads to Patala, this subterranean world. Hmm. And that's why they wow. won't open it anyway. So yeah, that's why I was uh, distracted when you got on the call. I'm into it. Mm -hmm. I want to go. I want to go visit. Let's do a pilgrimage. My friend so I, I saw this friend, he lives out in LA. The last time I was out there, he and I were hanging out and we were talking about this inner earth idea. And he says, you know, supposedly there's an entrance in Nepal that is guarded by these um, monks, you know, these, these Buddhist monks. Mm. And he was like, I really want to go there because there are these temples and supposedly there are doors that lead to these underground caverns. And as we're sitting there talking at a diner in Silver Lake, we run into a friend of his and she says, uh, oh, I'm going to Nepal next week. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah, dude. She says, I'm going to Nepal because this guy that she knows, he's like a rich philanthropist, is out there building uh, like habitation for the locals. And so mm. we're just our minds are blown because, you know, we're sitting there talking about how he wants to go there to see these temples. And he mentions it to her. She's like, oh, I'll, I'll go to the temple. I'll check it out. Fascinating. Kind of weird. That's sick. Mm hmm. I, uh, man, you know, I love technology. Yeah. I love, uh, <clears throat> semi equality for most people, but man, you know, ancient civilizations had some cool, some cool shit going oh, on. Oh yeah. Without a doubt. You know, this is one of my you own know, personal. Like, like, why don't we build, I, I, okay. Like I get it. I get it. Glass and steel are cool. But why don't we carve awesome things out of stone? Mm. It looks sick. Yeah. It's hard to do. You know, if I was a, I know, but if I was a billionaire, I'd be like, I want to, who cares about, I don't know, whatever. I mean, look at this effing temple, dude. Look at the it's detail. Crazy. That's 700 times more impressive to me than anything made out of purely like glass and steel. Get out. Yeah. Me. Well, there is a level of construction Gosh, that we just so don't, cool. that we don't mess with nowadays, you know? Um, supposedly yeah. we could build something like the pyramid, but we never would. Right. There's no point. Well, someone would come with, it, it would be so expensive and then it would be like, well, it's not an efficient structure because we can fit, a million times more square feet inside of a much smaller building mm -hmm. by doing it with modern building materials or something. I mean, I assume that would be somewhat of the argument, but I don't know. Speaking dude. of billionaires, form and function, baby. Speaking of uh, billionaires and building out of stone, there's a, th there's a thing quite close to me called the Georgia Guidestones. Have you ever heard of this? No, there are these mysterious, I think it's four or five, um, big monoliths that somebody erected in a field in Georgia and they're called the Georgia Guidestones. Nobody knows who put them up. A lot of people think it was Ted Turner mm -hmm. who lives around here and is very wealthy, oh. but the Georgia Guidestones have these rules for humanity on them and they're very contentious, man, because these stones came out of nowhere. They're giant granite blocks kind of arranged. I'm looking at one. Do not be a cancer on the earth. I'm down with the Georgia guy. Well, how about already. this? Maintain humanity at under 500 million people. That's the first one. Oh, never mind. <laughs> this sounds like a really great thing to weave into a plot of a movie. Right. Like some, some, this is the beginning of like a noir is like these things pop up and people are like, where are the, did this That's exactly from, what happened, you know, but they're clearly like built to last, right. you know, they're built to be a modern Stonehenge basically. Yeah. Oh, there's written in different languages. Yeah, it is a, it's a historical, not historical, but it's something that's for perpetuity. You know, that's the way it's designed. It has some like mm. astrological shit in it. It's a pretty interesting thing. It's basically designed that if it's not intentionally destroyed, it will be there until effectively until yeah and time. i was i was talking to my friend last night we we're yeah. talking about 
how there, you know, in Stonehenge and these various ancient structures, there appears to be, and a lot of times there's some astral alignment. Either they reference the stars mm-hmm. in them or they're put in a way that, <clears throat> you know, details a constellation that would have been overhead at the time. And this is no different. The Georgia Guidestones that, that were made incontrovertibly in the last 30 years um, do do something mm-hmm. similar. They have some, you know, z- zodiac element to it, and it tells you when it was made based on the stars. Just like the Hoover Dam. If you went to the Hoover Dam, there's a big granite block in the Hoover Dam that has the date that it was started and finished, but based in um, the based basically in astronomy. So if you knew where the stars were, you could tell when what year this was built. I think it'd be cool one day to do you know, a, uh, uh, sort of a, a trip around the world, but not just a trip around the world, but specifically mix in a certain number of these bizarro right. places, you know, like temples or mountains or things that people have been doing kind of pilgrimage type things to for a right. long time. You know, there's India, dude. So Wikipedia has a ton of information about all these disparate weirdo places that exist. But one that I recently got Mm -hmm. clued into that is utterly fascinating. And there's just so little information online about it is called the Hampi Temple. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's an Indian temple that has these pillars. And if you ding the pillars with like a stick, they make a tone and each one is the notes of hmm. the Indian musical scale, but built out of solid sandstone. And these are, you know, a thousand plus years old. And they're That's still to so this rad. day, they do not know how they made these. They don't know how they made these stones make different tones because the only real way you could do that is to hollow wow. them out. Like, you know, with a bell or something, it has to have, be hollow inside. But even that for it to be hollow enough for like a little ding to actually make the whole thing resonate. That it's, seems kind of, well, wild, they also have you know? dr- stone statues in this temple of guys holding drums and they're solid stone. But if you walk up and wow. you hit them, they make the sounds of the tabula, the, you know, that little Indian drum, but it's solid yeah. stone, man. If you look these videos up of this stuff, it's wow. relatively hard to find. Um, they also, it's, the temples are famous so for cool. having stone, chains so chains made out of one block of solid stone that are interlocking and can move and they're also no idea how they constructed these you know okay i'm gonna take a stab at how that works not i mean completely uneducated but i sometimes i I stumble across rando videos and there's you know like satisfying Mm -hmm. thing type that's kind of a meme you know and i saw this one and sometimes people will will fabricate metal and they'll fabricate pieces that Mm -hmm. are so perfectly designed to fit together that you just will put one screw but you'll basically put like a giant screw on top of another Mm -hmm. thing that's threaded perfectly and you just let go of it and it just Bing. yeah zoop, and you can't tell that right they're two place. separate pieces and you can't tell there's two separate pieces and you can't you don't have to screw it in it right. just I've falls into place now imagine doing that with stone tools 1500 years ago with stone tools and with stone not metal well the cnc is what you're talking about the um can basically a computer controlled routing machine where they take a a block of steel or whatever, and they use laser cutting to get these incredibly precise, uh, finished products. And if you look dude around the world, there's another famous place called Puma Punku that has these H blocks that are perfectly cut Hmm. in such an improbable way that you look at this and you're like, man, it looks like somebody had, a wet saw at a minimum or really laser engraving technology. It's crazy. Right. Yeah, I agree though. I'd love to go see all this stuff. Have you heard of, um, I want to see some of the natural ones too. Have you, have you heard of the great blue hole? Oh, I've seen, I've been wanting to go there. It's in the Yucatan. It's basically this mega, mega sinkhole in the middle of the ocean. (laughs) It's just a giant hole. And it, I think it connects to a bunch of cenotes basically because what's a cenote. 
uh, a cenote is basically an underground river. Okay. And there's a bunch of them in the Yucatan, all over Mexico, really, but especially the Yucatan, which is kind of the, that east pen, eastern peninsula where where um, Cancun and Merida and all these other places are. Mm. But I went there one time. It's incredible, dude. You you, you know you um, oh dude, it's it's kind of hard to overstate how cool it is to be in a cenote because we were in one, we were near the ocean. This was near Tulum mm. and you pull up and, you know, you give some guy seven bucks to make sure that your car doesn't get robbed. But then there's part of you that's kind of racist and wonders if he's going to rob it. But in reality, they're just trying to make a living <laughs> right? <laughs> and they didn't rob it. But then you rent some bootleg ass scuba gear or, or snorkel gear mm. for like one, one us dollar. Right. And then you just get into this cenote. There's no fences. There's no nothing else. And some of them are some of them are what are called open cenotes, which mm. is one of the ones that we did. <clears throat> and the way you do it is you just it looks like a little uh, like a little forest pond, you know. Like yeah. we both went to went to Covenant. There is a pond that we called the pond, mm-hmm. and there's just a pond. It doesn't look any different than that. It just looks like a little pond in the forest, right? Then you get in a the water is literally crystal clear, mm-hmm. like you can see. So it's so clear that you really can't tell how deep it is right? because there's no of uh, there's none of that sort of like refraction that like makes things look weird. You're just looking through air almost right? and you look down and then you get in and you're like, whoa, this is weird. And then you start swimming. And at first it's like 10, 15 feet and it's kind of, kind of, you know, just a dirt bottom. Mm. And then all of a sudden it's just like, boom, gone. And there's like 40 feet all of a sudden below you. And it's like stone. Yeah. And then, like, I kept swimming, and what looked like just a forest was actually really, really, really dense mangroves mm. that were growing way out over the land, and you can swim under them. But then what's crazy is that if you really go down and kind of look even deeper, um, you can see just caves that are filled with this water that go straight to the ocean. Eey. And, um, it's pretty freaky and you can swim around and we like did this one where we, we, it's just so weird because you come up and you're like, Oh, I'm in a little pond. And then you swim down and there's like 40 foot deep, perfectly clear water. And you like swim through like a little mangrove forest. We like would, we were like swimming under these growths where like, you kind of have to like take a really big deep breath and swim as fast as you can to get to the other side. It was really fun. And then there's some that are closed cenotes where you basically do, you know, some people are really adventurous and they go off the beaten paths ones. We were mostly doing, you know, relatively easy ones, but, um, we did a couple where, you know, you walk down these real shitty stone steps that are literally just carved into the rock. And then all of a sudden you're in this giant, basically cave cathedral and it's pitch black except for a few lights. And there's just a pond. Mm. And you're like, it's like Gollum's pond, you know, in Lord of the Rings. It's just there. And it connects, like if you could, and a lot of people do this, you you can technically, at least in theory, mm. swim between these cenotes. And all of them are connected, and all of them connect to the ocean. It's bizarre. But it, it makes me not that skeptical of the fact that maybe there are people who live under the earth. Because there are people that we've never talked to on top of the earth. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like Good how point. crazy it is. That there are caves that we just don't know about. You, That's not that crazy. When you look at the Great Blue Hole or stuff like this, like we went to, it's so, to me, I know not everybody feels this way, but there's something that f- it fills me with almost dread. We went to mm. Indonesia years ago because my in laws were working over there and um, we went in the Indian Ocean and we're on this mm. big boat and we go out and we're snorkeling. And you're just mm, you're snorkeling is very cool. And you're just you're out there, dude. There's nobody else around. It's super. The landscapes look just so otherworldly. And you're just out mm-hmm. in this warm water floating and below you, these 20 foot across mantas are just silently mm. gliding underneath you. It's the it is so terrifying in a way That's awesome. to realize that you are just this infinitesimally small speck on this earth and there is so much going yeah. on um just above you below you in other parts of the world you know we went to um komodo and they have komodo dragons there 
Mm. And you get up there and all the houses are on stilts because these dragons will go in to these people's houses if they could and eat them. And the only people that live there yeah. basically tend to the animals as a nature preserve. But dudes there, they keep them away with sticks, with forked sticks. And oh my several God. of the dudes that were running this place had lost fingers, had oh my bites word. on them. We watched just like in Jurassic Park, you know, where they lower the cow down and then the T-Rex tears it apart. We watched them t- <laughs> uh, hang a dead goat and these monsters just oh, no. climbing over. You just realize like, man, this when you're sitting in your basement or your house in L.A., like there is so much wild shit happening all around us that we are just oblivious to so awesome yeah that's so awesome i love it i love that stuff it that stuff you know okay so there's an element of dread Mm -hmm. there's also an element of well then my problems can't possibly be that big (laughs) right i think about that a lot you know like i i'm sitting here thinking about how badly i want to go to the big blue hole and uh and and get my scuba diving license and i'm like man that's that's gonna be there you know like that's it just puts work in perspective you know speaking of Mm -hmm. uh rollers psych we haven't spoken of it at all (laughs) (laughs) haven't even mentioned it yet 20 minutes in um no but Okay, so speaking of rollers, let's let's jump into a quick update. Don't get me wrong, guys. We're not done with our uh with our existential pondering, <laughs> nor will we ever be. Yeah, tell us. Give us but, a lowdown. What's going on? So, dude, I am this is gonna John, I don't even know if you're no. gonna believe this. I don't even know if you're gonna buy it. I think you're gonna be skeptical, and I don't blame you. I am Oh man, it's hard Uh-oh. to get the words out. Oh, I don't want to believe it. I want to, because uh, if I say it, it's real. Oh, uh, I'm going to do it fast. No, I'm not going to rush here. I'm going to make. I am handing over the uh, edit uh-oh. to another. Editor. Say what? Yeah. No. God, that was painful. <laughs> Why? Don't tell me, John. Don't talk me out of it. No, because because I'm tired, and I don't know that. I think I, you know, I've been saying this. I I needed to get as far as I could. I needed to wait until the point where I feel like I didn't didn't have something to offer that someone else did. And I I think I'm at that point. As much pain as it causes me to admit it, I think I'm at the point where. Not just, I think a lot of people might think I'm like too close to it, and it's actually less that. It's more, I think I have reached the limit of my skills as an editor. And, um, I think it's, I, I think it's time to, to let somebody else take a crack at it and kind of do a finish pass. Um, I think I partly feel like I can do that because I've made a lot of progress on the story. Mm-hmm. And I think the consensus among the the handful of people that have watched it is that the story makes sense. It is working. It is it is flowing. And now it is smaller things that are holding it back. Mm. And um, I'm you know I'm ready to I'm ready to put myself back in the director's chair instead of kind of sitting on the arms between the director chair and the editor chair. Right. So, and how do you feel? I mean, out there now, it's official. I don't think you should feel any sort of way about this in the sense that like when I was working on that house, my dad and I built a house. You don't think I should feel physically ill with anxiety? (laughs) It was like my dad can do anything in terms of building a house. You know, he's just like super. But dude, there's stuff that he... There are other guys that do this stuff every day. But could he day. build the Pashkvanashka temple <laughs> in India? Give him two trillion dollars worth of gems, and we'll see. Um, <laughs> dude, that means there's a, over a trillion or around a trillion dollars worth of stuff in that temple. Anyway, um, but he can do virtually anything. But there's stuff that dudes that do that stuff every single day are way better at. And he's just like, "All right, yeah. time for them to do this," you know. And yeah. I don't think that you should feel anything about it 
like you didn't do the lights yourself on the movie. You hired somebody, right. they came in, they did the lights. Like Thank maybe God. you could have done it, but like the guys that do it every day, they're going to be faster. They're going to be better. Yeah. And there's, you didn't feel weird about that. No. And it's not just that they'll do a better job. It's that I can now more effectively wear the hat that I am uniquely able to wear. A beret, you know, the definitely a beret <laughs> or a fedora. <laughs> But, ooh, it's not a fedora. So what what do you mean though? Be more specific. So you you're saying you're putting your director hat back on, but what does that mean? Well, I think what that means is <clears throat> um I am so it, it, I I'll be specific. I well, I don't want to put them on the spot because we're still working out some details and I would hate for it to be awkward if it didn't work out. There there's a group that that is kind of helping me with this. Um and I will gladly talk about them once I kind of know that it's not going to be weird later. But yeah, there's a um, there's an editor who's very passionate about the project and feels like he can help. He brings a very different skill set. He's kind of been doing commercial stuff for a long time, mm. has, you know, a lot of skills in terms of kind of style editing and just making things cool and sexy. And I think what I'm getting to when I say putting on the other hat is there's it's getting to the point where there are so many details to pay attention to it's very much like it was in production where for a little while it's been like well i just move this scene here and move this scene here right you know that's i mean that's a little bit oversimplified mm -hmm. but you know what i'm saying and um and now it's getting to the point where i'm like i need to be able to look at this movie from a, a different perspective from a much more, I need to be able to look at it as a movie and not a series of dude. I don't know how many cuts hundreds and hundreds of unique little cuts. Right. I can't look at it that way anymore because I have to start judging it on a much larger level with, um, you know, with music and with, and, 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 and I just can't do that if I'm doing both. Also, I'm just, I'm just getting to the point where like my attention is just kind of needed elsewhere and I'm right. starting to drop, drop certain balls because I, I can make really great notes on what needs to happen mm -hmm. with the movie in a number of, you know, maybe let's call it three to five hours. I can watch the movie. I can go back to stuff. I can take very detailed notes. I can condense those notes. I can have a conversation about it in under five hours easily processing through a list of let's call it 75 unique notes takes a couple days right if they're re if they're reasonably easy and if it's a bigger issue it takes even longer so it's like i just got to i got to not be doing that um what, what you better believe that was hard for me yeah but it's just it's that's what i'm curious about coming at the urging of people yeah go ahead well, that's Why not, is it hard? Well, partly, but also like, I don't know. I maybe I'm projecting here, but I it almost feels like there's a slap to your pride or something almost, and I just think that that's like nuts in a way. Yeah, it is. Am I wrong about that, or is your pride wrapped no. up in this? No, there's pride. There's pride, and there's also just control, right? And you know, so it scares me. It scares me, if I'm honest. Yeah. I think this is dumb. Every great director does this. You like how I subtly included myself? In the pantheon. <laughs> you like how I did that? <laughs> I do. Uh, just kidding. But they do. I mean, every, every, yeah, every director. No, you're right. Every, every director who is, let's put it this way. Every less of a judgment thing and more of an objective call. Every director who is serious about making the best movie they possibly can routinely gives up control. Right. Um, and I think that may come as a surprise to certain people because they think of like, you know, people like Tarantino or whatever is just kind of being these control freaks or like, I want it that way. But that isn't actually how it happens. You know, Tarantino or Wes Anderson, all these people, you know, they, they, they just have a team that they trust. And, um, and yeah, I just gotta, I just gotta do that. You know, it, it is pride, but it's also just, I'm scared. I'm going to watch the movie and it's going to be better without me. 
Oh, you know, really? I mean, well, don't get me wrong. That's not what I think logically. Right, right. I understand all the logical arguments why that's stupid. But yeah, emotionally, that has that is probably what's there. I'm guessing because I don't know exactly what I'm feeling on the inside, but but that's something about it. It's like I'm going to watch it and I'm going to I'm going to be like I should have done that earlier or he's better at something than me. And it's like, you know, that's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, but it hurts. I mean, when I was a kid, a yeah, when I was a kid, I was in a band, I played the drums, and I was like, mm. you know, I was self-taught. I was like, eh, I'm okay. I'm not great. I'm right. not probably not. I'm not even good, honestly. But I'm like, you know, I could play with people. Sure. Um, so we had this little band, me and two of my good friends, and at some point, my my one of my best friends for life, like kindergarten through 12th grade we're still friends he is an exceptional guitarist and a really good singer and he started he didn't we didn't break up the band or anything but he started on the side playing with this other drummer who was (sighs) really good he was phenomenal you know like Mm. he just was excellent he had played in marching bands and he just he was awesome on the set and dude we still were playing together but when i found out like wait, you're playing with Steve on the side, dude. It, I was crestfallen. I was devastated. Mm. Mm. And, um, it really, because of that, because I held on to that, dude, it totally screwed up my relationship with my friend for a year. Mm. Like I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't want to hang out with him. I was pissed about it. Um, and I had, I've had to go back and apologize to him about all this, but, um, I totally understand that. Like it's, I like to think that I'm older now and I wouldn't do something like that, but you know, I'm even married dude. And like you go hang out with a dude and and you're with a dude that's like funnier than you or smarter than you. And it's like, it stings, man, you know? (laughs) So Mm -hmm. I totally feel that I feel it on that level, but I'm also like your objective here is almost work. And so I know it's personal and I know you've put a lot into this. Of course you wrote it, you directed it, you, you did 90% of the editing um, but it's at work. If a, if somebody came up to me and was like, yo, I'm better at these expense reports than you are. Let me just crank them out for you. I'd be like, hell yeah, dude. <laughs> so I know. there's two potential ways to look at it. No, that's a, that's a good way to put it. I, I think to sort of back up to, I think what led to this being possible for me to actually do it. First of all, I don't regret finding the story. You know, I, I think I needed to do that. I think I needed mm-hmm. to effectively do some rewriting right. myself. Um, and I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I took the time. Could I have found, uh, you know, a more direct path to that point? Yes. Um, did my need for control and sort of my OC- OCD tendencies to make everything perfect unnecessarily make that a much longer process than it needed to be? Yes, I will admit Mm. that. Mm. Do I regret it? No, because it's my first time, you know, and I got to offer myself that, that slack, which yeah, you better believe I'm saying that doesn't mean I actually believe it. (laughs) I'm not actually offering myself any slack. I'm just saying I should offer myself some slack and then maybe one day it'll actually happen. Well, I can tell you as an outside observer, like I, that doesn't even register like that doesn't even raise my needle at all right. you saying that you had to hand it to somebody like you're not that's not even what you're saying really you're getting no, i think if anything people who are college. wiser than you're like why did you hold on to it too long right you know right, right. and and again i'm saying both sides like i need to offer myself some slack that i gotta hand it off and i need to offer myself some slack that i held on to it for a while i did mm-hmm. what i did i don't regret it i think i made the right call I think next time I'll do it better. Mm-hmm. But I think what has actually led to this point, and I can I I I don't know if I could have said this even a couple weeks ago or even a week ago. I am at the point where I, I'm not getting tired of the project, mm. but I'm getting tired. Yeah. And the project I've said this many times many different ways. The project is starting to become expensive to me emotionally Mm. you know i'm hitting the point of diminishing returns where the 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 sneaky thing about the point of diminishing returns is 
is you start receiving fewer returns for the investments you make. Right. That is a known that's the, the the sort of the thing you automatically think about. But I think when it comes to emotional investments like this or time, it's not just that the returns shrink, but the investment grows in its significance because yeah. it's that last it's the there's a big difference between standing a foot away from the edge of a million foot cliff mm. abyss and standing half of an inch away there's a huge difference between those yeah one is is you're pretty much good you're pretty much in control just don't be an idiot one when you're half an inch away you really are teetering and you really are susceptible to the winds of of whatever of which you are not in control mm. and i think i sensed myself so uh, you know just to be specific over the weekend i was i was in baltimore this week um this weekend i had a great time we went to another baseball game oh. went to an orioles game no, no. <laughs> okay, fun Sorry fact. for you. You actually knew that. I'm gonna. No, 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 it's okay. I texted John a picture of the baseball game, and he said, "See you, babe. Cal's going out. Um, going out on the town." Um, I texted John a, a picture of the baseball game, and it was beautiful. You know, it was like seven thirty, eight p.m. The sun was going down, and and John says, "Man, that looks dreamy, even if it is baseball." <laughs> uh past john so anyway uh past john is hilarious Mm. anyway so um so you're in baltimore point is okay so i'm in baltimore and the orioles the worst team in baseball objectively Mm. beat the colorado no not the colorado rockies they're not in the same division beat who the crap did we play it doesn't even matter the team was like one of the second best teams in the in in their division, or the the best team in their division. We beat them thirteen zero, which was hilarious. It just was a, wow. It was, we, it was crazy. Anyway, the point is, I was I so I was in Baltimore. The baseball game has nothing to do with it. I was sitting there with a good family friend of ours who I've known for a really long time, but I feel like I haven't really mined his uh, his wisdom as much as I could. His name's Dave Thomas. He is um he's the he's one of my guy. dad's best friends. <laughs> I'm always like, Dave, why square? Yeah. Why? You know, and he's like, well, Three we started and, you know, once you build a brand, it's pretty tough to reinvent it. That was the best answer I've ever gotten out of him. Um, so I was talking to Dave. Dave Thomas is, uh, is an incredibly accomplished physician who um, is the head of the infect- infectious diseases department at Johns Hopkins. Wow. And so he's got like literally a world renowned, like he, he like flies all over the world to like speak to people and shit. You know, he's done, he's at the top of his game mm-hmm. and he's not even an old guy. You know, he's his mid fifties. Mm-hmm. He's at the top of his game. And I was like, Dave, you know, what am I, ha, what do you, what do you have to say to young whippersnapper Zay? Who's, you know, probably flying a little too close to the sun, mm-hmm. you know? Cause I was like, dude, I want to do some stuff. I want to make, I want to make, I don't give a shit about legacy, but I was like, I, I think I've said this on the show, you know, I want to make the next Indiana Jones, you know, like Mm. I don't want to be a content creator. I want to be like a myth builder. I want to do stuff that I I, want to, I want to do my version of building that crazy temple or something. I mean, I want to make stuff that, that, yeah, go ahead. Did you say this slash feel this way when you started Rollers? I think I did. Okay. I really think I did. Um, I'm curious what the record would say. You know, obviously I have hindsight, but that's part of the reason I did it. Because I don't know for sure. Right, right. Um, of course I'm going to say it after the fact. Right, right. You know, of course if Rollers is successful, I'll say it. But that's part of the reason I'm saying it now. I want to say it now so that if I fail, I can't cop out. And if I succeed, I can't be called a fluke. You, you know, seen, I kind of just want to be real. Have you ever seen the Temple of Doom, though? I mean, there's three Indiana Jones movies in the original uh, trilogy, right? 
Raiders of the Lost Ark, right. which is insane. It's awesome. The Last Crusade, which is one of my favorite movies. It's phenomenal. Right. And then the Temple of Doom, which I tried to watch with my kids the other day, and we could not make it 15 minutes in. It's so terrible. It's it it's not good. No, and and that's the thing. I'm not I'm not fighting for perfection. Right. You know, what I'm fighting for though is I want to take some big swings. And um and I want to make some stuff that that makes people ravenously excited. So what did you the know? Wendy's guy say? So Wendy's guy Dave says, you know, cuz I was like, look, I I I know how hard that is. Um I also know because I I I see you know, I, I okay, on one hand, I know how hard that is. On the other hand, I know everybody's not trying to make it in my field. Right. Lots of smart people are trying to make it in other fields and lots of people do it. And lots of people even make it in my field. You know, like there are a lot of people who have done things that I would consider absolutely exceptional. You know, there's a lot of Steven Spielbergs to some degree. Sure. Now they're all very different from each other, but a lot of people don't think Steven Spielberg is all that great. A lot of people don't think George Lucas is all that great. They're like, I'm Kubrick or die. So at the end of the day, I'm not worried about pleasing everybody. But what I do want to do is I want to make stuff that is exceptionally good. Mm. Um, I don't know that rollers is it is possible for rollers to be quite that. And I'm coming to grips with that. And not because I, I will have failed as an artist. Right. Um, but because uh, as you have been quick and thank you for doing this to point out, I had limited resources. I'm a new, t I'm a new guy. And you know what? Like as much as I love kind of the entrepreneurial spirit and the entrepreneurial abilities of sort of the culture that we live in, all that kind of stuff. The truth is the apprenticeship model exists for a reason. Mm. And it has been around for a lot longer than people who just become overnight sensations. And you know what? In a way, um, if rollers was a piece of garbage, I don't think it is. So far, no one seems to think it is. But let's say rollers is a piece of garbage. There's a huge part of me that in my sort of entrepreneurial take on the world, blah, 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 or, you know, mindset, I'm like, well, then I have failed. Mm. But you know what? I also never, I, I don't have, th this is my apprenticeship. You know, I don't have a master to work under for a decade. I, right. I didn't have that privilege. And so if I did fuck it up and if I did kind of make a mistake, I don't think anyone who's ever done anything exceptional would look on that and be like, well, too bad. Um, because anyone who's done it knows how friggin' hard it is. Right. Now, at the same time, like I said, I know there are a lot of people who make it. There are a lot of people who do exceptional things in a lot of different fields. And the more I'm around it, the more I'm like, well, the people who are doing this are normal people. And um, and it's becoming increasingly to me, it's 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 becoming, you know, the idea of pulling that off is less about luck and less about innate talent and more about how many times am I willing to, to go back to the drawing board? How many times am I willing to do the work when it hurts? And I've talked about that in this process. Mm. So all of that, you know, we're talking about all of that. You know, and I kind of said, look, Dave, I want to do all that stuff, but I also don't want to give up anything that I'm going to regret, you know, because that was one of the things that he mentioned kind of in the process of that conversation is people that he has met. Because, again, he's around those sorts of people, you know, like he's right. he's in that world and he's like. People kind of joke that people with one Nobel Prize sit around talking about all the people that have two. <laughs> because if you have one, and he's totally serious. He's like, if you have one, there's a certain amount of luck involved as there is with anything like that. Um, and so people who have one are like, well, like, you know, they're just worried. It's like, that's, that's absurd. Mm. It's completely absurd. But hearing that from him was kind of weirdly comforting, you know, and I think some people feel the same way about like Steven Spielberg versus somebody who has one incredible hit. Mm. And it's just like just one incredible hit is so hard to pull off and you should be so grateful that you get that opportunity. Right. Um, and so anyway, let me wrap this up. Basically what I'm trying to say is, I, you know, we're talking about all this, all this context, 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 context. Right. And I said, look, I'm trying to 
figure out how to always be kind of right on the edge because I know that I have to push myself, but I'm also increasingly, especially in the past month, aware of how close to the edge I am in a lot of ways. And I am starting to wonder if I took my eye off of the kind of the safety switch, you know, and if I got a little deeper than I meant to. That's kind of the most like honest take I can give everybody right now is like I am a little bit wondering, not if I like fucked anything up personally, but I'm like, okay, I might be half an inch from the edge when I thought I was a foot. And that's a scary place to find yourself because you got to take a step back. But what I said was, I want to keep finding the balance. And without even hesitating, I said, you know, like, I want to ride on the edge. I'm kind of like, I want to have it all, you know, I want to ride on the edge, but I want, and Dave, without hesitating, was like, be careful, you know, like, be careful, period. Because he has seen, you know, and I think anyone who's been around long enough has seen people give things that they wish they hadn't given. And 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 no number of Nobel Prizes is worth giving certain things up, you know? And I think that's hard to believe before you have a Nobel Prize. But I kind of want to choose to trust those people, you know? I want to... I want to not have to learn that lesson the hard way because man, if I'm lucky enough to win a Nobel prize or a Pulitzer or an Oscar or whatever, I sure want to enjoy it. You know, the great and not sit around talking about the people who have multiple. Anyway, go ahead. Well, the great quote from the Bible comes to mind and that is, um, Mm. what should it, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his soul? Hmm. And I, Amen. you know, it's that it applies everywhere. You know, I've seen people that have lost their family or a spouse because of their careers. And I, there are not many people that are thrilled about that at the end of their life. Yeah. You know, people that have estranged kids because of choices they've made, not even mistakes, but going after something that maybe they shouldn't be going after. Well, I, I mean, to bring it back to movies, yeah. can I just add a quick course, introduction? Please. I mean, interjection. But to bring it back to movies, you, you know, da- uh, Damien Chazelle, mm. who made Whiplash and La La Land and First Man, I'm, in, I gotta be honest, I'm increasingly less interested in his movies because it feels like all of them are rehashing that theme. But all he keeps doing is doubling down on the decision. You know, mm, like mm. Whiplash is about like, what are you willing to give up for the dream? Right. La La Land is about what are you willing to give up for the dream? From everything I hear, but I didn't see it because it doesn't look that interesting to me, to be totally honest, since I missed it in theaters. First Man is about what are you willing to give up for the dream? Right. And I'm kind of like at a certain point, I want to know what it's I, I, I I'm not interested in asking that question anymore I want to see what Damien Chazelle feels or what he wants to write about when he decides to not give something up for the dream or when he reckons with the fact that he gave something up that he didn't mean to that's the next story that I want to see a guy like that tell um and maybe he will you know I'm not for, for telling any of that, but I think in movies it can happen the same way. Like that's those movies are less interesting to me than, than to me. I'm kind of like, man, what happens when you do that? Mm. Or what happens when you quote unquote settle and then find something new in the process? That's exciting. We're always being told two things or we're, I I feel like that the life is all about duality. And in Mm -hmm. one, in one frame, we're all told that, you know, family and friends and relationships are the most important thing. And that's what you should hold on to. But then there's a whole other school of thought that is more aligned with Chazelle, like go after your goals at any cost. You know, your will is the highest and most important thing. And Mm -hmm. I think Potentially both are true and you'd have to find a model of somebody who is living like this, but surely it's possible to keep relationships and keep your life in order and still be very successful at what you do. 
I think so too. And I think that's kind of what I'm trying to say a little circuitously is maybe the middle is the most unique one, you Mm -hmm. know, maybe especially from a storytelling standpoint, maybe you discover something about yourself that allows you to find the breakthrough that you never would have found if all you did was focus on the original path. Right. Um, I'm too young to say that definitively, but I, I feel like that's what I would come to the, I feel like I would find that, you know, I've, I've found it in little ways. Like if I stop trying to quote unquote, fix the movie, you know, I had a good conversation with Tiffany, one of our EPs Mm. and she was kind of like, look, um, she's like, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you, Isaiah. You know, again, this is one of those things that makes me a little nervous to share on air, but whatever. That's what this show's about. Mm-hmm. She's like, I got to be honest with you, dude. I like what you're doing here. I'm going to do a voice. Tiffany doesn't talk like me. She also doesn't talk like this. She's like, I like what you're doing here, kid. <laughs> yeah. But, no, nah, I'm done with the voice. But she said, I like what you're doing here. I think you're on the right track. But I got I to gotta say it. I got to say it now. Don't forget that you're making a movie and that you told me and she even asked me this she's very smart she said who do you want to watch this movie who is this movie for and I kind of said I was like I know this is vague I know this is a little unhelpful um, but I, I think this movie is for kind of everybody I think it's for everybody who's willing to who's open to it you know I think yeah. it's to me it is a movie about humanity you know and it's Yes, I think we have a built-in audience of musicians and artists who have kind of become obsessed and and and, and put their identities in their work and, and are questioning things and, and especially like late millennials who are young or older millennials who are kind of like, uh, what are we fighting for and and who am I? All that kind of stuff. I think it, I think it asks a lot of those questions in a way that will resonate with that crew. But I was also like. I just kind of want it to be a good movie, you know, like I want it to be a good movie the way that, you know, when I watch a movie like high fidelity, I'm like, that's just like a, a, yeah, it's a movie about music, all this kind of stuff, but it's kind of a movie for people who are just into watching good shit. Mm -hmm. And, but what's tough is that that's weirdly a harder needle to thread because you can't, plug in people who like watching good shit into a fucking Google algorithm and target it and hope that they watch it. Like you got to do something special to pull that off. And what she said was like, I love that you just said that, you know, because that's, I think what you've been saying. And that's what I think you, you could still do, but she's like, you got to, she's like, I want to say this now. Don't forget that. Like you have to, entertain people you know i've said this before like you have to make it so that people want to watch this they're not going to do it for you as a favor right and no one's going to buy this movie because it's cool or interesting they're going to buy it because it's a great watch you Mm -hmm. know and i have really felt convicted about that and and the encouraging thing was that i came away from that conversation feeling like it affirmed the direction that i'm heading in not it, every cut of this movie has gotten more entertaining and less obtuse. Mm. And mm. I am ultra committed to the idea that like all the big heavy themes and all that kind of stuff, that's all there. It's woven into the DNA of the movie. And now it's time to start trusting that. And it's time to start making this movie a freaking blast to watch, you know, because that's the stuff we remember, you know, like I'm not an art house filmmaker Mm. and I keep slipping into this little thing where I'm like, I'm doing this thing and there's all these layers and these themes. And didn't you notice this thing? And didn't you notice this little piece of decoration? I've I've said this so many times that I keep slipping into it, no matter how many times I try not to. But the truth is I got to make a movie, you know? And like, and she was just like, I want you to make the movie you want to make but I also want people to see this thing. Mm. So don't get distracted by the details. Don't get distracted by the fact that you sort of have something to say and forget that you have to make it awesome and entertaining. So I, I, and I think you've said that. I think a lot of people have really voiced that opinion and it's been very encouraging in a way to feel like 
that actually always comes as a, a welcome reminder as opposed to sort of a shocking reset, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, you know, we're... <laughs> I mean, we're all sort of searching for meaning in life, right? And like, if you do art of any kind, you want it to be imbued with meaning. You know, I think that's important. And I, I get that impulse. And I think a lot of times we're, <clears throat> we forget that people just like a good jam and people like to have yeah. fun and you can pack depth in there. But ultimately, she's right. You got to bring people in with the fun. Um, yeah. And I guess back yeah, and door, like a guy like Dave back, Thomas. Yeah. Sorry, no, no. Dave. I just say I backdoor the message or whatever. What was what about Dave? Well, I was going to say a guy like that's got to deliver results. Right. It's like, yeah, I'm doing some research. I'm trying to come up with a vaccine for hepatitis C or whatever. You know, it's like at the end of the day. You can dream all you want, but at the end of the day, if you're not making people better, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and, and you only get so much time. And I think with rollers, it is getting to that point, you know, back to kind of the exhaustion, back to the sort of the shift in mindset. I'm getting to that point where I'm like, I think I've kind of sucked the marrow out of this project. <clears throat> um, yeah, you know, Bryce reminded me the other day, he's like, you know, I was describing kind of where I'm at with this. And, and he was like, you know, I don't know who said it, someone, we can look it up, but he's like, movies are never finished, but they're abandoned. And well, I think that's really insightful because that's about where I'm, I'm not ready to abandon it permanently, but I am getting to the point where I'm like, I don't know if I have anything else to offer. Mm -hmm. I got to start making room for other people to bring what they want to bring. And what's exciting is that, you know, I talked to my music guy, Dan, I talked to other people and they are chomping at the bit to bring what they can bring. And, and so far, um, I don't know uh, for so far, it's not that I've been that stubborn, but like so far again, like I said, I think, um, I don't know, like. I, I was using the the Frodo analogy, of course, because I'm a little <laughs> and nerd, and B have a messiah complex. But I was like, you know, I, I gotta I gotta like carry this ring, and you know what? There's truth to that. But at the end of the day, I gotta be willing to be carried. You know, like I can't. Mm. I am more willing. I'm getting to the point where I'm more willing to to sort of be loved on and carried up the rest of the hill for a while and take a rest. I want that more. I, I, I want what I, I want to humble myself enough to, to allow that to happen more than I want to finish AKA self-destruct this project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Yeah. And cause dude, it is so to answer your original question. Yeah. It's all about pride, dude. It's all about pride. Cause I want to run that fucking ball all the way down the field, yep. you know? But that's not how it works, baby. We're a team. And you feel better now. Do so. you feel better now? Well. <laughs> Theoretically. You know. <laughs> Theoretically, I think I will feel better soon. I think I'll feel better once I kind of like actually finish that handoff. Because there's, there's, you know, there's stuff involved. Mm. You know, I got to like get files over. I got to get people acquainted with where things are at. I still got to. So, but yes, I am starting to feel better. Um, and I think when it's going to feel really good. It's going to feel, I think, uh, uh, I think it could feel euphoric um, uh, when I watch the first cut mm -hmm. and it's good, yeah. you know, I think that's going to be in, and it's good in ways that I didn't intentionally sort of do myself the same way that when Christian would come up with some great shot and light the crap out of it. And I looked in the monitor and I was like, whoa, I couldn't have done mm. that myself. Um, I want to feel that way with the edit, dude. I'm yeah. ready. You know, I'm ready to feel that with the whole movie. I'm just so pumped for that. Um, Do you wish? So anyway. Assuming that something like that happens, will you wish that you have that you did this from the get go? I don't think so. You know, I kind of touched on that a little yeah. bit earlier. I think, I think no, because I don't know that 
I don't know that I could have done it earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, bring back the sports analogy. You know, you you can't throw a Hail Mary if the wide receiver's not in the end zone, you know? So I think at some point I had to be patient. I had to push it this far. I had to I had to kind of hold down the fort and find the story. I had to put the scenes in the right order because I know the characters. I know all the things I've tried. I know why things are a certain way. Um and and at the end of the day, too many cooks in the kitchen can be a disaster. But the vision is the vision. I feel confident that the vision is 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 locked in. Mm-hmm. You know, the vision is there, and now I can trust that the vision is clear enough to other people that a cut's not going to come back and it would be like, no, 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 this is not the movie I decided right. to make, and that would not be their fault. That would be my failure as a director, but that's a failure I don't frankly have time right. for. What I do have time for, you know, so, so does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't think that you should have any regrets. I don't think that you should, um, you know, it sounds like you're saying I should have regrets, John. (laughs) I mean, you did so much of the like difficult legwork already. Like I think about going from the first cut you had to about the third, you know, just this like, Ooh, baby, that was a dark time radical transformation well it was maybe but it was also like a huge transformative moment for the film um and you know i thought to myself around that time like if he can do this again or not you but if if this that quantum leap that was made from first to third cut if that could happen again you're going to be in really good shape and so Mm -hmm. you know i i feel the same way like i look forward to seeing what they'll do And I don't think it's, you know, in the same way, like with the music, I know I keep harping on this, but I just think it's important. Like you're not going to do the music yourself. You're not going to score it yourself. You never were going to. And even the editing, you weren't originally going to edit this yourself. That only came about because of possibly you orchestrated it subconsciously, but also things (laughs) happened. You know, certain things things transpired. People got busy. Yeah, totally. Um, Right. 100%. And you would have, like, if the main actor had dropped out the night before, you probably would be in this movie a lot more than you are. <laughs> but, but I don't Ooh. see any of this as, Ouch like, slash I don't, true. <laughs> it's 100% true. Well, me and my wife, well, I don't want to get up on that. Um, no, 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 go, go, I was going to say, go, me and my wife, know. you're in the movie, but it's good. Me and my wife both were like, yeah, man, dude, he's, like, one of the stronger actors in this, nice. I thought. Um but no, I think it's crazy. Not that, you know, I don't want to call you crazy, but I think it's nuts to feel bad about this. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> I think, um, you know, it is both, it's both, it's exactly what should have happened. Like I have this, this same friend that I've been talking, I mentioned many times already. He told me over the, this past weekend, he's a web developer. He runs his own business and he had Let's this be huge, honest, John, you're talking about Teddy Bronson, Teddy Braun. <laughs> He runs this right, your friend uh, that lives in LA, not Teddy Bronson. Go ahead. He does live in LA in New York and he has this web development business. And one of his biggest clients was this diamond merchant. Oh geez. Who was doing hundreds of thousands of dollars in profit a month, supposedly wow. on the books. Right. So my friend is doing tons of work for this guy, completely rebuilt his site. Um, and over the weekend he, he finds out that this dude has gone missing Oh geez! And <laughs> right before like, he left, like uh, like concrete blocks tied to his feet in the Hudson River, missing the, or eventually, like a different yeah, kind of missing. Yeah, no, right. yeah, yeah, exactly. Eventually, it will be that. But yeah, he took a bunch of diamonds, and he took a Oof. bunch of money, and he shut down the business, which was actually losing preposterous amounts of money. Turns out, and he disappeared. Uh-huh. And my friend, who was doing all this work for him, was had kind of gotten close to this dude and he was upset you know he got screwed out of a ton of money and the future contract that's gonna hurt it hurts but he looked at this whole thing and he said to me on the phone the other day i wouldn't do anything differently even from the jump i did you know i did good work for the guy i acted appropriately you know i can't help who's gonna blow up and what's gonna happen i can only Mm. control my own actions in this and he's like i look back to the whole thing and i think i did exactly what i should have done and he's like and now I pick up the pieces of my business and I move on. I find new clients. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a different situation for you, but that I was surprised by his mindset. And I also was like, man, Mm. inspired by it. And 
I did say this to you before, like how we respond to challenges. Mm. That's what shapes our entire lives. Mm. You know, and kids, even as little kids, like how you over whether you overcome adversity or you don't, you know, you can tell in a person as an adult what happened in their childhood or at least mm. how they responded to it. And there is like a there's an importance to being resilient and picking yourself up and moving on and not taking these failures as a sign that you're a failure or that the mm. universe is trying to tell you to quit. Like Steve Jobs, we've mentioned it before, like he got fired from Apple computer, <laughs> started his own business, oh which was like gosh. fine, but he got fired. You know what he did if, while he was fired? He started Pixar, bro. True. Yeah, he did. <laughs> which is he to did. your point. It's insane. You know, like, Right. Don't he could wallow. have gone home and started drinking and been like, man, I'm, oh, yeah. I, I can't even work at this shitty company I started. When he was but, rich, he could have retired. He didn't have to do sure. shit. You know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're in a different situation from that, but it, everything, your future will depend on these different difficult circumstances that have happened, how you respond to them and what you do next. Mm. Dang, man. That's great. Thank you. We'll leave it there. I appreciate huh? that. You know, well, yeah, I, I, the last thing I'll say, because you know I have to have the last word, John. <laughs> you know I do. Just kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. Edit the last thing out. I'll say. Um, no, thank you, first of all. That that actually really means a lot. And I think it's what I needed to hear. And I think also, um, you know, I, I think the reason I need to hear that is because the only thing that makes me anxious. I don't sit around thinking about how I wish I had done things differently. You've asked me that a couple times. I really mm -hmm. don't. What I sit around thinking about that makes me anxious mm. is will this movie solve all of my problems and right. will it make me into the director that I want to be? And the answer to that is nothing. The answer is not no and the answer is not yes. The answer is that's not an answer you get. That's not mm. a question I have any right to ask because the point is to do what I think I need to do today and tomorrow and everything beyond that is virtually irrelevant. You know, like mm. your buddy doesn't need to sit around thinking about how he wishes he had done things differently because he can't. And, right. and, and he doesn't need to sit around thinking about how he, how he wishes he could do things differently tomorrow um, because he doesn't know what tomorrow will bring, you know, like he just needs yeah. to do the work. And, um, and I find that really inspiring because if you can make that choice in the middle of like a very difficult adverse situation, then, then who's to say you can't make it in the middle of a, a, a good one, you know? Yeah. So anyway, well, people um, will, people will, you'll make your situation good or bad, whatever it is. I mean, you, we know people that are going through horrific times that have like fantastic outlooks and we know people that are living luxurious easy lives that are utterly miserable and complain about every tiny little thing that happens to them so you know the the answer to your question real i think it is no in the sense that the movie the quote-unquote movie whatever happens with it is not going to solve any issues i actually that is a much more realistic answer absolutely i mean even if it even if it's a huge success, whatever, you're still Zay and you still yeah. bring whatever issues you have to the table. You you have to. I'm not saying you have issues you need to deal with. I'm just saying in general, this thing will well, not solve anything. We all do. You yeah. right. The, the issues that you have are yours to solve. Yeah. Regardless yeah, of what happens. Well, you know, this. all right. I know we said we we're going to wrap up. Two two thoughts for me, and then I'm going to give you the closing word. I want to know what you think about this, <laughs> and then I'm going to keep my mouth shut. First of all, I've Maybe. been reading a book called Man's Search for Meeting. It's a memoir written by a guy named Victor Frankel, Frankel, who was a psychologist, a Jewish psychologist who was, who was put into Auschwitz for mm. a, a good significant chunk of, uh, of World War II. And... It is, it's called Man's Search for Meaning. I'm only halfway through it. I haven't gotten to the happy part yet where he kind of makes a little bit of sense of it. But already he's talking about his accounts. You know, half the book is about accounts from Auschwitz. Half of it is about his time afterwards. Mm. Already though, just in the, just while he's still at Auschwitz, you know, he talks about 
the difference between the people who give themselves over to the nihilism of the place, you know, who just survival, survival is everyone's priority, but, but survival at any cost right? versus survival in a, in a, in a, in a dignified way is what separates everyone there. And he talks about hmm. the way that there's meaning to be found even in the darkest of places. That's been a really inspiring thing. Man's Search for Meaning, it's a tiny book. It's like 100 pages long. You can read it in you know a few sittings. Um, it's really great. Second, um, to your point, you know, I, I was talking to my dad. I was up in Baltimore. Mm. <clears throat> I was talking to him. And, and, and he was like, how, how do you perceive what you've done so far? You know, how do you feel about this? And I said you know, I've got two goals, you know, and, and I was talking to Dave Thomas about this too. I said, I've got two, I, I, I kind of have two goals. And to your point, neither of them are really fix it goals. Um, Mm -hmm. the first goal that I've mentioned on here is I want to find a mentor. You know, I want to find, I mentioned the apprenticeship model. I, I do hope that rollers is, is, is good enough and seen by enough people to attract the kind of director or producer mentor that not only can help me professionally, but can, can really like, I mean, not just like give me opportunities, but can really teach me, you know, and can really kind of like with, with like, if you want to, you know, be a a researcher, like you kind of got to find a PhD program and you got to work for somebody doing work for them. Right. To some extent, I just need to find somebody like that. So that's one goal. Um, and, and the other one is, you know, I said like, I didn't set out to make, you know, Wes Anderson is, is, is one of my favorite directors. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, I didn't set out to make Grand Budapest Hotel or the Royal Tenenbaums or, and which by the way, some people hate those movies. Right. So to your point, like no one's ever happy with everything, but those to me are, are basically masterpieces. And, and I said, I didn't set out to make those. I did kind of set out to make a bottle rocket, Mm -hmm. you know, which a lot of people don't think is that great. I think it's brilliant. And I'm okay with that, you know, and I think if, if I, and again, I don't, I don't know that I need anyone else to tell me whether or not I made a bottle rocket, but I want to look at it. I want to look at it at the end of this thing and I don't want to think, oh, that's perfect. Or, oh, I had everything I could have possibly needed. What I want to look at is say, I had a vision and I fought like a freaking dog to make that vision come to life. And what I ended up with was a, was a unique interesting, voicey, complete story that says something and does something that isn't just kind of like the, you know, that it actually has something to say, not that it's perfect, Mm -hmm. not that it's huge, but that it is, it is unique and interesting and solid as a piece of art filmmaking. Mm. And, and that people, and to me, because I want to be a commercial filmmaker, part of how I will judge that is if audiences connect with it right? because the audience is the other half of this, but the size of the audience, the number of dollars that it generates is kind of irrelevant to me, you know? And I don't know. I, I, I think that's, that's, that's kind of how I interpret a little bit of what you're saying in terms of like the answer is no. Yeah. The answer is no, but at the same time we have to fight towards something or else we just get lost. And for me, it's important to remind myself that like, I'm not fighting towards perfection. I'm fighting towards stuff that I love, you know, like I want to make a movie that I think that I'm going to love because if I love it, then I think other people will love it. Right. Um, Okay. Well, I I want to hear what you think and then I'm done. I'm not going to say another word. (laughs) We'll see about that. I, well, the reason I said that it won't solve your problem and I, I said this, but I'll reiterate is that, it's it's the the film itself whether it's a success or not a success it that not, that's out of your control the yeah. it, you know bottle rocket royal tennis mobs i'm positive i know B- bottle rockets lost a ton of money it didn't make any money yeah. i mean maybe now it has but right. a lot right, right. of no it was box office flop yeah wes anderson's movies many of them have not made much money Right. Well, dude, the the Life Aquatic is easily one of the most important movies in 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 my life as a as a filmmaker. Right. A lot of people think it's his worst movie. Right. But I love that movie, and it was so important to me. So anyway, go ahead. Well, that's. I mean, this is the the point, I guess. In another way, is he had a vision, he executed that vision, and who like it, the people that like it, like it, the people that don't, don't, and that's the end of the yeah. story. 
And none of that hmm. will, I mean, yes, I a hundred percent, you have to fight to make this as good as you possibly can. And now you're almost yeah. in a, you're in a technician area now where it's, it's, it's actually more cut and dry, whether the mm -hmm. changes are quote unquote good or bad, you know, is the scene moving at an mm -hmm. appropriate pace? Is it cut? Well, like that, that's technical mm -hmm. stuff that is either happening or not happening. Um, but yeah, you 100% need to fight for this. But keeping in mind that the the response to it, the quote, whatever the audience thinks, whatever the money generated is, these are just these are ancillary things in a way. The real change yeah. of you, the real Zay change, will just be how you respond to this stuff, how you mm -hmm. think about things, and how you move forward. You know, if it is a success and it goes to your head and you become a complete jackass, that's not a success. Or if mm -hmm. it's a failure and you go into a deep depression and you never do anything again, it's same same issue on the opposite side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. But you're going to still yeah, be man. the dude you are, you know, six months from now when this comes out or whenever it comes out, you're going to just be you. Mm -hmm. Taking big dumps in the toilet, eating Mexican food in L.A. Like, it's just mm -hmm. you. Yeah, farting in bed, getting yelled at. <laughs> yep. It's just you.